Hello and welcome to our Sabbath School panel as we continue studying the Sabbath School quarterly title, The Gospel According to Paul, Corinthians. This week we are studying lesson number six, Lessons from the History of, His of Israel. Before we dive in, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we chart in heaven, we come this moment, this morning, to give you thanks and to bless your name for all the blessings that you had bestowed upon us. We thank you for the sunlight. We thank you for water and for food, for everything that we receive Amen. from your hands. Dear Lord, in a special way, we want to thank you for Lord Jesus Christ and for the amazing sacrifice that was done on our behalf. Please forgive us and help us as well to forgive each other and others as we want to be forgiven. Now, dear Lord, as we are about to study your word, we want to invite your presence to bless amen. us and to guide us. In Jesus' name we are asking, amen. 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 Today on the panel, we have Brother Orlando, Brother Jordan, and uh, myself, Timmy. Before we begin the main lesson of the day, we are going to have a brief review of the last week's lesson, Principles Regarding Marriage. If you would like to study along with us, you can find a digital copy by visiting sdarm.org slash publications. You can also find it on your mobile app through um, the Apple App Store or Google Play Store by simply searching SDARM. Brother Jordan. Thank you. So as we're going through this quarterly on the book of Corinthians, we're seeing that there's many parallels with society that we live in today and the society that uh, the Apostle Paul was confronted with in his ministry in Corinth and also the church at the time. And there was many lessons that they had to learn to understand how the principles of the gospel were different to the principles that they learned in that society. And as we go through this review and as we saw last week, one of those areas which had been greatly perverted in society in many different ways in Corinth was in relation to marriage mm -hmm. and in relation to the relationships that God would, that God ordained and that he would have his people be involved in. And so marriage and, and sexuality was greatly perverted. And I think that it makes sense to us why we're studying this yes. in this quarterly, because we see this is one of those parallels from the time uh, that the book of Corinthians was written here. And so we're going to spend a few moments here uh, reviewing this important lesson on these biblical principles regarding marriage as kind of a summary of the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians here. And so in our uh, key text for this lesson, we have this, this reminder that marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So this is something that God cares about. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that is. And we have this promise there in the note that when the divine principles are recognized and obeyed in this relation, marriage is a blessing. It guards the purity and happiness of the race. It provides for men's social needs. It elevates the physical, the intellectual and the moral nature. So God cares about this because it's something that actually affects our happiness, our well-being and the well-being of others around us. And so this is not just, um, you know, God, uh, God uh, putting this restriction upon us for no reason. It, there's a blessing attached to this. And so, Brother Timmy, uh, as we look at the, the first part of our lesson, a man and a woman, when did God celebrate the first marriage? And I'm going to add to that question, if you can help us. What was God's original design for marriage? It's amazing that God celebrated the first marriage in the beginning, right from the beginning day in the Garden of Eden. Uh, it says that God created man in his own image. Now, uh, how, would, uh, how would God look like if, if we are created in his image? Uh, we may think, would God look like us? But when we read in Genesis 1, 27, he says, God created him male and female. So this combination together, man and woman, that makes together the image of God, the mm. uh, seriousness 
combined with tenderness, Amen. the strength combined with kindness, the um, justice combined with the goodness, the strength wow. combined with beauty. These are characteristics of God and the masculine principle with the feminine principle combined, reflecting together the character of God. And that was right from the beginning was as a gift that God gave to, the, to all the humankind together, a man and a woman, to reflect the image of God in the union Amen. of a family. Amen. Absolutely. I love that you highlighted there that word that's in that note. And I won't read the note, but just emphasize this point that it was a gift. Mm -hmm. yes. Because today, unfortunately, in society, many people have, have come to look upon biblical marriage as a curse, as mm -hmm. a restriction, as something that is old fashioned, as something that's a hindrance, it's a burden. Uh, not a gift, not a blessing. And so we are, we need to go back to that, to that purpose and that intention that God had. And uh, you're exactly right. It was the, the, one of the first things that God did there in creation before sin, right? There was this before gift given. Sin. We needed, we needed this, like you said, this um, image of God reflected together with the male and the female. We needed that even before sin, yes. Yes. right? To, to balance each other out. And so imagine how much more, you know, God wants no. to bless us after sin. And as if well. I may add, the Lord Jesus Christ in the beginning of his ministry, that's how he started his ministry with a wedding. Yes. yes. Uh, he blessed that wedding with his presence. Yeah. So it's like the beginning of the Old Testament and the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Amen. Starting yeah. with uh, this beautiful mm -hmm. illustration, yes. the family. Yes. And it was, it's fascinating because we know based on John chapter one, that the Jesus Christ himself in his, you know, pre-incarnate form was there at the creation of the world. That's so right. you actually have there, as you mentioned in Cana, you have the creator of marriage, attending marriage to show that he's blessing this institution when it's rightly mm -hmm. understood and when it's rightly practiced. Um, he says there that he didn't begin his ministry by doing some great religious work or going to the Sanhedrin. He went to a household gathering in a little Galilean village to bring joy, to add mm -hmm. joy to the wedding feast. And he showed that he cared about um, the happiness of mankind, right? Amen. And so um, he, uh, he shared this example with, with us and with his disciples that this was an important um, event and an important, an important relationship there. And so I, I love that you brought that out, the parallel that it was there in the beginning of creation and it's there at the beginning of the work of redemption. And those two things are very closely linked together. Amen. <clears throat> and brother, um, all good gifts come from, from, from above, right? From the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, if we would include not just the uh, Sabbath, not just the, you know, the, the beauty of, of Eden, but also marriage in the gifts that God gave us, we would treasure it more. Yeah. We would, you know, keep it and, and, uh, and protect it. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And we're going to talk about that, <clears throat> which it come, came up a bit later as we're reviewing this lesson about um, treasuring those things and, and looking to um, restore those things that came out of Eden. So let's go to the second section now as we, these first two sections are designed to, to help us understand marriage as it was originally created. So as brother uh, Timmy uh, hinted at here, or he actually mentioned, um, the original design was one man and one woman, right? And not just one man and one woman, but leaving and cleaving. That's section number two. Mm -hmm. And so God ordained there in Genesis 2:24 that a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, that there should be this special union between them, um, not an abandonment of our parents, you know, not no. to dishonor our parents, but there needs to be a new union formed where it is the husband, his wife, and of course, God needs to be as well Amen. in the center of that relationship. So we, we have this mentioned here about the sacred circle. Maybe you want to share something along those lines about yes, that. Yes, uh, I, I, I really appreciate the thought that is brought here from um, 
the faith I live by, it's in the note, page 252 from the book, it says that within this circle, new circle that is created, mm -hmm. no other person has a right to come. Not even the parents. It says, let not the husband or the wife permit another to share the confidences that belong solely to themselves. Mm. Uh, yes, we may have uh, confidences and friends even in the church, we may have um, uh, very good brothers and sisters uh, in the church family, which is a sure. beautiful family that the Lord gives us. But there are confidences that belongs only to the family. And that's a sacred circle. Only Lord Jesus Christ has the right to give counsel yes. there. Yes. Mm -hmm. It says around each family there is a sacred circle that should be kept unbroken. Mm. Mm -hmm. No one has the right to come there to, to say only Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, is that verse in, um, in the Old Testament, the, the, the rope that is blended in three, correct? Three. Yeah. Yeah, Husband, right. wife with Lord Jesus Christ. It yeah, doesn't right. say other uh, strings. Come. Yeah, Ecclesiastes 4 verse 12, I had that in my notes here. A threefold cord correct. is not quickly broken. Yes. Yes. So a cord that is connected together, braided together by three. Exactly. And we should add here as well that um, in, the, in the fallen condition that we are, we sometimes as spouses, um, there is a need to seek for spiritual guidance and counseling. But we should emphasize that in that, in that circumstance, it should be done together. And there should be, an, you know, it should be done with both spouses uh, okay. present and both spouses agreeing upon you know, um, and, and understanding what what is to be shared and, you know, what is not to be shared. And and there is a need sometimes for Christian counseling and spiritual guidance, but it becomes, you know, um, it becomes very difficult when one spouse, you know, starts to confide in, in somebody else, you know, absent the other one. And so, but there are, of course, things that, you know, that are kept between mm -hmm. the couple and, as well. Yeah. And uh, Brother Jordan, um, it's also counseled to the ministry or to those that are working in the vineyard of the Lord to be careful not to try to break that barrier and mm -hmm. enter in mm -hmm. to where it only belongs to the two Correct. that are that mm -hmm. are the spouses. And um, that that is a very important counsel uh, to to even the ministry, right? Even mm -hmm. those that are yeah. working for the Lord. Yeah. So leaving and cleaving from the family, you know, the parents and the, you know, the extended family to each other is the first part of this. But then there's the second part. You not only need to cleave to your wife or to your husband, but this is on Monday part B. I'm, I'm summarizing here and connecting it. Um, but there's another cleaving that needs to happen, and it mm. should actually happen before we are married mm -hmm. as individuals. And it's actually the only way that we can truly live in full harmony. And that's, that's right. a cleaving to the Lord. To Christ. Right, to Christ. That's right. And, uh, and I think that this is such an important aspect that's overlooked in society today as well. The, the need for a spiritual foundation to be at the, at the center of our marriages. That's very correct. I'm thinking, uh, as you said, even before, if, uh, if uh, you are a young person and you are praying uh, to, to find uh, the right uh, person to marry, what about praying me to be the right person to marry, correct? Yes. Uh, and then uh, uh, if Christ abides in me and Christ abides in the other person, it says uh, uh, beautiful here, uh, we are all, all married here, right? Mm -hmm. It says, Christ abiding in the heart of the wife will be at agreement with Christ abiding in the heart of the husband. Amen. So if uh, the right Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, the true one, abides, then uh, there is agreement. And we should be guarding that not the spirit of false Christ would, would come in any other way. But we want Lord Jesus Christ, as it says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then what a beautiful harmony in the family. Yeah. I love that part of the note. Christ abiding in the heart of the wife will be at agreement, sorry, with Christ abiding in the heart of the husband. And so sometimes in our human nature, we tend to think and, and, and maybe we've heard it said, you know, 
well, I, my relationship with Christ is very good. And the reason that there's conflict in my relationship is because my, my spouse isn't, does not have a good relationship with Christ. Mm. But if, that, if we are thinking in this way, it's evidence that really we, have, you know, we are not as close to Christ as we need to be. Because if we really were, going back to an illustration from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 from this book, it actually tells us that if one does happen to be an unbeliever in the marriage, it says that the believer's influence should sanctify. It yes. should help to draw that person to Christ with the possibility in verse 16 of actually saving them. But when we take the, the, the moral high ground and say, well, I have the relationship with Christ and they don't, we tend to push away and it's a form of actually um, doing the opposite of saving and being a, a, an influence to win them to Christ. It's actually pushing them away and we're we're taking all blame for failures in the marriage, you know, away from ourselves and putting them on the other person. And so this is essential. Um, we are to strive to come as close to Christ as possible. And then we will see our own defects. And in every difficulty in marriage, um, because there will be difficulties, uh, in every difficulty, yes. we will see in its, in its accuracy, we'll see the part that we have to play or that we had to play in a certain disagreement or a certain trial. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be able to be honest with ourselves. And so Christ in my heart, as we mentioned, this is the first mm -hmm. key to a successful marriage. And uh, Brother Jordan, I like when you said that there will come hard times and we should be ready or we, we should understand that the enemy will actually bring or circumstances will come that will be hard. But together, we can work, right? It says, mm. they will be striving together for the mansions Christ has gone to prepare for those who love Him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, when one may fail, the other one will, is there to pick him up. That is the blessing that God has put in marriage. Amen. I think by this, even the question of uh, compatibility that sometimes is brought can be solved. Mm. Look at that sentence. It says, where the Spirit of God reigns, there will be no talk of unsuitability in the marriage relationship. The Spirit of God, when it reigns, will, will solve that, uh, that if there is a, that question. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And so then we saw briefly, we've kind of touched on this, but the, the principle there in the last part was that we are to love our spouse with the same love that Christ has for the church. That is the, the from the Greek word, the agape love, mm -hmm. the yes. pure self-sacrificing love. And we can only get that from Christ. You know, it's a divine love. It has a divine source. And that's why it says, make Christ first and last and best in everything. And as your love for him becomes deeper and stronger, your love for each other, each other will be purified and strengthened. Amen. And so that's God's ideal for marriage. And we are to ever keep that in mind. Mm. Um, and we are to recognize that as we live in this world of sin, that unfortunately, marriage has broken down. Marriage was actually the first thing in the fall in Genesis chapter 3. Marriage was the first human relationship that broke down. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 12, the man blamed who on earth? The wife. The wife, right? Yes. You know, that was, that was a separation instantly between the man and his wife. Now, I know that she was the only person around. But he specifically says, you know, the wife that you gave me, the, yes. the marriage relation was instantly affected by the fall and by sin. And so we need to recognize that we are living in a world where sin has affected all of our relationships, both between us and God, but also between each other and including our marriages. And yet the gospel is about reconciliation. Mm. Genesis 3 was about reconciling, which is to bring back, to restore harmony between God and, and man. So that, that is the, the um, vertical relationship. And it's also about reconciliation in the horizontal relationship. Yes. And we often forget yes. this. We often focus on the you know, my relationship with God and making sure I'm prepared for heaven. But the gospel is about restoring broken Amen. human relationships. Yeah. And so the title here, God hates divorce. He hates divorce because of what it does to people, the damage that it causes, emotional, um, psychological, spiritual, all of those things. 
and his purpose in this broken world that it was not in harmony with his perfect plan for marriage is under the circumstances for to he has given principles for us to um, to be able as far as possible to bring about reconciliation in all relationships but including the marriage relationship and so that's why in uh, Matthew chapter 19 verse 4 to 8 when the Pharisees questioned Jesus he -hmm. didn't point them back to principles that were given after the fall although there was a necessity for some of those principles but what was he trying to direct their minds back to, Brother Orlando? To the beginning. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning was when God established it, right? Mm-hmm. He established the institution of marriage. That's the ideal. We need to go return to there. Amen. Amen. In the note, it says that Jesus, when the Pharisees afterward questioned him concerning the lawfulness of divorce, Jesus pointed his hearers back to the marriage institution as ordained at creation. And so he was trying to direct our minds there. In a Mm -hmm. perfect world, there would be no divorce, right? Mm -hmm. There would be no separation. But but we are, and we of course, we are in a broken world, but we need to always think, how can we, in harmony with the work of the gospel, because the gospel is about reconciliation, how can we move back to that original ideal? Mm -hmm. How can we seek to reconcile and not to... um, get out as easily as possible from the marriage relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and they insisted, it says, why then Moses um, yes. still gave the command, uh, verse 7, to put her away. But then Jesus says, Moses, um, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered. Yes. So that doesn't mean that Moses was that happy about that no. at all. No. He, he suffered. And then Christ repeats them again. He says, but from the beginning, it was not so. Yes. No, mm-hmm. that was never God's plan. Yeah. And so in uh, section B, just for the sake of time to, to review here, in uh, section B, God declared that because marriage is a covenant relationship, a co- and the, the origin of the idea of covenant has its perfect fulfillment in the gospel, where God made a covenant to be faithful to humanity no matter what they would do. That's why Mm -hmm. Jesus, when the covenant for man's salvation was made, that is the very reason that Jesus came to the earth to die, even if if there was a total rejection and and nobody appreciated him, because that's what happened at Mm -hmm. the cross. There was acceptance of Jesus before the cross, but when it was totally abandoned, Covenant is faithfulness to the other person despite the circumstances. Covenant is not keeping your end of the, the promise when things are looking good. Right. That's convenience. Mm-hmm. Right. That's not covenant. And so God says your marriage is a covenant and it's to be taken seriously. And for that reason, he hates divorce. He hates putting away um, because of all of the um, damage that it causes. Yeah. Right. And so in cases of divorce then, because of course God's perfect will is no divorce, but in cases of divorce, um, the instructions that we see here given in scripture, I believe are, again, going back to that principle, if the gospel is about reconciliation, the instructions that God gives are for um, reconciliation to be always a possibility right? Mm -hmm. As much as possible. Reconciliation. These are not instructions given to try and, you know, uh, push a person further away or to make them feel, you know, even worse about their circumstance. It's to leave the door open, right? And Mm -hmm. one of those is, is if, even if there is a breakdown in the marriage and uh, if both, if both spouses by remaining unmarried, they allow for the possibility of reconciliation to happen. And I know of cases where the people have chosen to do that despite a breakdown in the marriage. And after many, many years, by the grace of God, they have been able to find reconciliation and been able to come together again. And so if the door had been quick to be closed, what would have happened? If they had decided to take another option, that option would never be available to them, right? Yeah. Brother, I would like to say that... um... 
um, it mentions here the unbelieving spouse, right? Mm -hmm. The one that does not have the same faith mm -hmm. as the believer. Uh, but the Bible describes to us how faith is produced or how is it how does it come to us by hearing. And if there is an, a, a separation or, or a, um, you know, absence one from another, you don't have that opportunity to share your faith. Mm -hmm. So we, the believer should always have that as their focus. Um, I want to share the faith I have. The words, by the power of the Holy Spirit, may work in the heart of my spouse mm -hmm. and restore that marriage and the faith in, in Christ. Mm -hmm. Yes. My, um, uh, I have a few thoughts, you know. My thoughts are towards those that have suffered disappointment mm. because it happens. Satan works so much to destroy the image of God and to destroy the happiness of the families. And my thoughts are about um, if we read the end of the note, uh, Thoughts from the Mouth of Blessing, page 6, mm -hmm. an excellent book. It says, uh, now as in Christ's day, the condition of the society presents a sad comment upon heaven's ideal of this sacred relation. Yet, even for those who have found bitterness mm. and disappointment, mm. where they had hoped for companionship and joy, there is, uh, there is hope. It says the gospel of Christ offers us us. Amen. It's, Amen. it's Lord Jesus Christ that can uh, fill that emptiness uh, where, where we're waiting for companionship and joy, came bitterness and disappointment, but Christ can come there. Amen. Hmm. I want to share on that a Bible verse. It's actually this, and the continuation of the key text for this lesson, okay. which was Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 where it said marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. And we sometimes stop there. And I stopped there on purpose when we introduced the lesson because I was waiting to get to this point about we often read this as a warning and we feel, wow, this is a, you know, it's a, a judgment on, on this, you know, on going outside of God's plan. However, we don't often encourage people and say, look, God warns us against adultery, yes. fornication. He does warn us that, that judgment will come. Marriage is honorable. However, we don't often go over verses 5 and 6 with people. And listen carefully. It's exactly mm -hmm. what you were mentioning. Verse 5, let your conversation, that's an old English word for behavior, mm -hmm. be without covetousness, which mm -hmm. is desiring something that is forbidden by, by God, right? Let your behavior be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Amen. I think if we read Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4 only, we're right. missing the rest of that verse. Mm -hmm. Because here in Hebrews, the, the intention is that we would continue reading. And as you said, sure. to be comforted there. And I just wanted to add one more side note as well. Um, <laughs> we've, we want to do as much as possible to restore these relationships, to not take the easy door out. However, we understand that in some cases, um, a person may be physically unsafe. Sure. They may be in danger. Their children may be in physical danger, right? And in those cases, you know, God does not expect, you know, a person to remain in the same, you know, place. They may separate and hope and pray for a potential time to be reunited. But in an unsafe situation, you know, we, we want to we wanna understand that correctly. However, many people do, do not, you know, their situation is uh, far less concerning than that. And for the minor differences, you know, by the time of Jesus, the people had the smallest excuse as why there was incompatibility and why there, th this the relationship could not continue. So I think that that is important to mention. But as you mentioned, Brother Orlando, um, the just simply the pure fact that a spouse has a different belief than us, you know, is an unbeliever and has not yet accepted Christ. This is not a hindrance. This should not be a problem. This is an opportunity. And this is our first missionary work. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. That's, That's the missionary right. work that God has for, for the person in that case. So now we 
looked at as well, as we're just reviewing here, I know we're spending a considerable amount of time on this, but we looked as well that um, the book of Acts um, mentions a time of restoration that will come, right? Mm -hmm. Be at the end of time and it will, and it will look to restore all things that were in existence since the beginning of the world. And uh, that is God's purpose for his people in these last days to be a part of that restoration. And we see that it includes all of those things that come from Eden. I'm kind of summarizing mm -hmm. these two questions mm -hmm. on Wednesday. It is, there's two things listed here, marriage, the original diet, so marriage right. and health. There are also um, several others, and maybe you have considered these before as well. There was obviously the Sabbath. The mm -hmm. Sabbath. There was also a stewardship. Man was given charge of the earth. Mm -hmm. He was given a gift entrusted to him not to keep or to use selfishly, but to take care of mm -hmm. stewardship. And then also in the beginning, man was created with, as Brother Timmy mentioned, the image of God, the character of God. And therefore, all of these things need to be restored. Mm -hmm. The character of God in man, a proper understanding of stewardship with the gifts and the, and the abilities that God has given us. The Sabbath needs to be restored. Um, there is a place for the restoration of the original diet and health. And then as we're discussing here, God wants to restore the marriage and the family relationship. And we see that all five of these things, Satan is especially destroyed. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when these things are restored, it says that in Acts, uh, he will send Jesus Christ. That's right. And Jesus Christ will come. And the beautiful says uh, in, um, in the note of Thursday, Desire of Ages, it says, then heaven and earth will unite finally together in praise from one Sabbath to another, everything like as it was in the beginning. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> And so we see that um, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, we just to round this out, we see the work prophesied of John the Baptist who would right. come before the first coming of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it prophesied also of a people that would have the spirit of John and, and carry that message before the second coming of Jesus. And it says that the work would be to turn the hearts of fathers mm -hmm. to children. So the work was not focused on creating, you know, um, rules and regulations that would just force people to get along. You know, let's just lock the door and keep the families at home and not let the kids leave. And that's what we call getting along. Mm -hmm. The work has to go to the heart. And so that's essential because this is the only way that there can be true revival and restoration of anything, including marriage and God's ideal. And so he wants to reach the heart. And that's the key. To, um, to successful marriage. And that is the key to um, living as an example in a world that is very similar to the world where Paul was writing to here in Corinth, where there were so many perversions of marriage. There would have been very few godly examples of how much of a blessing Christian marriage was, biblical yeah. marriage in Corinth. And so as Paul was writing to encourage this, I'm sure he had in mind that others could also be affected by that positive blessing. And I think that that's what God wants for the world today as well. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jordan. Uh, this month's first Amen. Sabbath offering is for world missions. Uh, to date, the Universal Postal Union has 191 nations and territories listed in their system, and the United Nations recognize 195 countries worldwide. Yeah. How many now have ye not yet received the present truth that can save their souls? While all may not be equipped uh, to take the truth to all the world, we each can take part in spreading God's work, both at home and abroad. The Apostle Paul reminds us that some have not the knowledge of God. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? The task of sharing the everlasting gospel with an entire world is the call of the hour. Your generous donation of 
Any amount can be made by visiting sdarm.org slash donations. Now, at this time, we will move on to into the main lesson, Lessons from the History of Israel. Brother Orlando, please. Thank you, Brother Timmy. And uh, thank you, Brother Jordan, as well, bringing us to the conclusion of the, of the review lesson. And I think it ended with the um, work that must be done today, with the, which is a work of restoration. And reformers are not destroyers. Reformers mm -hmm. are restorers of Amen. paths to dwell in. Um, I really enjoy the Sabbath school. I really enjoy the journey that the Lord brings us through in His Word. And the Sabbath school is the tool that brings us to that journey, through that journey, uh, or to understand the journey. Mm -hmm. So I hope that this uh, lesson, this new lesson, the lessons from the history of Israel, brings a vivid picture to us as a people today, how God actually brought His people from Egypt to Canaan. And that journey is similar to what we are traveling on today. And those lessons are for us. Uh, the memory text, Brother Timmy? Yes, it says, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. For whose admonition, brother? For ours. For ours. Mm -hmm. But how can we say that the um, people of Israel in the times of Moses through the desert, that those lessons apply to us? Um, weren't, aren't times different? Uh, aren't these different times? Aren't these different trials? Um, is it that we have, we would say, the same weaknesses? As, as men at that time? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, it points there that even Satan is uh, ready to introduce the same evils, the, the very same, and the results cannot be different. It says the same results and laid so many in their graves. Um, That's why it's a big admonition. Yes. Thank you, brother. And his goal is reached, right? Uh, he uses the same evils. He uh, has perfected the temptations. We will touch upon some of those in our lesson today, but um, brings about the same results. Yeah. So the warnings are for us as well. On Sunday, the subtitle is Lusting After Evil Things. What are some of those evil things, um, Brother Jordan, that are brought out in our lesson? Well, they very quickly forgot the slavery and bondage and the terrible curse that being in Egypt was. And they somehow had associated some of the things in Egypt with a positive experience. Mm. And they now desired to bring a little bit of Egypt out with of Egypt them. with them. In the form of here, um, they lusted after the flesh foods of Egypt. When God had provided them what Exodus chapter 16 verse 4 tells us is bread from heaven, mm. the manna, mm -hmm. which they, manna, it was such a, a unique food that the word manna that they came up with in English, it would, it would be equivalent to calling it what? What is it? Right? Because they had no clue. So it was this bread from heaven. And in Psalm 78 verse 25, it called it angels food. Mm -hmm. So God had given them something that was that was for their best good, that was healthful, that was nourishing, that you know tasted good. And um, he was trying to lead them away from the, the lifestyle and the diet and the influences of Egypt that would affect their physical health and by affecting their physical health would affect their spiritual health as well. And so for this reason, it says there in the note, he removed flesh food from them in a great measure. And then further down, it says that um, the perverted appetite was to be brought into a more healthy state that they might enjoy the food originally provided for man, the fruits of the earth, which God gave to Adam and Eve in Eden. Thank you, brother. 
um, as you did review on our lesson, that the Lord at the beginning gave them gifts for their happiness, mm. for their health, for their joy, mm. and not just that, for a long life of, of enjoyment. Um, and after sin, we know what has happened. Degradation, not just of, of the physical stature of man, the physical strength, but even the emotional, right? We have, we have lost a lot. They must come back to be restored. And so this is what um, the Lord wanted to do. He was bringing his people from Egypt. Now, what do we compare Egypt to today? Spiritual uh, decline or spiritual darkness. Bondage to sin. Bondage, yeah, slavery. The world, sin, right? Slavery. Isn't it mm -hmm. the world? So even though we may look at this picture as, okay, that was the people of Israel in the time of Moses, but that has an application for those who are coming from the world, those who are coming from those places where there are evils and, um, and, and things that are unhealthy. The Lord wants to bring back that restoration of true goodness, and, and happiness in the in our lives. Preparing for the heavenly Canaan, correct? And going on this journey. Yes. Going to a different place, one Amen. that will have eternal eternity as its measure, right? Hmm. Um, question B. If I could just mention something yes, brother. briefly before we go to question B. In verse five. Yes. Of Because uh, question B is going to talk about the story and then over the page, we're going to go down in, in chapter 10. But in verse 5, talking about this experience, that it says, But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, mm -hmm. it's interesting to think about that concept of being overthrown or conquered, okay, because that's what to be overthrown is. And, and, and what happened was we know in the wilderness that many of them, they didn't make it to the promised land. No. Only how many out of the probably more than a million individuals. Right. Two. Two, right? And so the concept was that they were conquered because in, in, a, in a literal way, in a sense that they were overthrown by physical death, but they were also overthrown by spiritual death as well. The enemy conquered not just, you know, he didn't, you know, they, not just physically, but spiritually as well. And so there is a connection between our lust for things that are not healthful spiritually and the effect, uh, no, sorry, I should say physically, uh, our lust for things that are not healthful physically right. and the effect that it will have to, con if we are conquered physically by the lust of the flesh, we will also be conquered spiritually mm -hmm. in the battleground of the mind. And so I, I read verse 5, as because this is what we're going through um, this first part of chapter 10 this week. Yes. And when I read verse 5, I think of a double application to the way in which they were overthrown. Overthrow, overthrown, overcome mm -hmm. by the evil that the enemy actually placed at, at their feet or right nearby mm -hmm. them. Um, we may say that's a fall, right? Uh, we, we can fall into temptation but we want to describe a little bit further what brings us to that, uh, that, that fall. How do we fall? Um, so it is mentioning lust. Mm -hmm. Can you describe lust to us, brother? Yeah, it says there was something that they, they really wanted was part of their memories. And when we look in Numbers chapter 11, he says there was a mixed multitude, some Egyptians, right? And mm -hmm. he said the children of Israel, they wept again. Hmm. So they lasted it so badly that they started crying and says, wept again, saying, who shall give us flesh to eat? Mm. And, you know, it, it, it made a picture in my mind. I opened the Bible in Numbers 11, verse 10. It says, then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. Yes. Imagine more than a million people at the door of their tent, their families. Can you imagine an entire neighborhood? Who will give us uh, flesh to eat? Yes. What sound is there? It says the anger of the Lord uh, was, was upon them, came upon them. Uh, it says that uh, God gave them a whole month to, to eat that. Mm -hmm. And uh, God uh, 
says, until the flesh that you were lusting for came out at your nostrils, they were hit by a uh, stroke by that great plague. He says that he despised the Lord. Yes. Now, uh, and they were so much, again, it's a lesson for us. Yes, yes. A lesson for us uh, with, with diet. We may all have something that we, uh, we like and may not be good. He says that they wanted so much. Verse 32, he says, the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day and they gathered and they gathered and they gathered. Mm. They, it says, at least gather 10 homers. Yes. Much. They wanted so much. And the wrath of the Lord was against that. Yeah. Interesting that you mentioned verse 32. And for us to understand that these were not poor people that were going through starvation and they just needed a little bit of food to supplement their diet. Um, because uh, I did some research to try and understand what was the quantity. You mentioned as well, they were staying up, you know, the day and night to gather. And uh, if you see there in verse 32, as you read, that he that gathered the least gathered 10 homers with an H in front of it. Mm -hmm. The measurement approximately from what most people can, can gather is that 10 homers um, equals 1,000 omers, which was another biblical unit with an O, wow. the same spelling, but with an O. Mm -hmm. And wow. so ten, so they gathered one, the person that gathered the least gathered 1,000 omers, and the portion of manna per day, we're told in Scripture, was one, one omer. omer. One omer. So they gathered the equivalent, and if you look at, um, so they gathered the equivalent quails, for 1,000 days, if you're comparing it just purely to the amount of manna, hmm. and if you look at the measurement in, in gallons and in pounds, some people estimate that it would have been around 581 gallons or 4,850 pounds. These, that's why these people were piling this food because it says that it was scattered um, about two cubits, which is about three feet high mm -hmm. in verse 31 for a day's journey all around the camp. Yes. And they were, so it was scattered that much and they were collecting it. So the scale, that was the person that gathered the least. This was not just some poor people that were hungry. This was unrestrained indulgence and intemperance and gluttony. And that is why hmm. the Lord came down with such a judgment. They were not some starving people that needed a little bit of sustenance. And this, this brings a point that we can apply for ourselves. You know, when it's something that, that we know is not good for us, and, and we know that God has our best interest in mind, not just related to food, other things that God forbids, you know, it's never just a little bit. No, we it, because as soon as we open the door to to last and, to, and we're overthrown, right? We're mm -hmm. overthrown by the temptation of Satan. You know, it's never just a little bit. It starts off one way and then quickly the door opens and we also fall into unrestrained indulgence in yes. whether it's it's our diet, our appetite, whether it's also, you know, we see examples in, in their experience of immorality and things like that as well. But the scale with which they were gathering was enormous. And although God, I just want to read one verse here. Okay. In Psalm 106, verse 15, although God gave them the desires, you know, of, of their heart and filled them up physically, Again, we said that there's a connection between the physical body and the spiritual faculties. In Psalm 106 and verse 15, I want us to notice the language here. It says that, well, verse 14 says that they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And verse 15 says, and he gave them their request, talking about the physical food that they wanted. He gave them their request but sent leanness into their soul. Mm -hmm. Leanness is, is starvation. So what happened? Physically, you can feel like any time you fall into, into overindulgence to lust, physically, you feel, wow, I have just taken everything I wanted, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, have you ever been at a meal where maybe the food is even healthy? Maybe, and I don't want to say this. Um, <laughs> I want to be careful when I say this because I think we all can understand this one. Maybe it's a Sabbath potluck. Mm -hmm. And have you ever seen so much good food? You just feel physically full, yes. but your mind is not always in the right place. And for them, 
They were physically full, but spiritually God sent leanness. He sent malnourishment, starvation to their souls. Why? Because it overcomes us. It overcomes us and we can no longer reason um, clearly. And so God will give us these desires. One thought. Sometimes. Yes, brother. I think uh, of a, a great lesson for us. Um, yes, the easiest way is to relate it with food, you know, because... Uh, sometimes when we eat wrong things or, uh, or, or something or drink something that is wrong, it's not for our best, uh, we suffer, correct? Mm-hmm. The body reacts. And then how do we think? Oh, if I can uh, get well again, I will be uh, um, mm-hmm. careful. And when it comes again, uh, we, we try it again. Now, and uh, comes a moment when it's too late and not even as, uh, you know, This society believe, I have a a friend that is a medical doctor and says, society believes in the magic pill. You know, you get sick, you get a pill, and then you get well again. But comes a moment, he says, these people died. Uh, Comes a moment when we can die as well through the abuse of of certain foods. But I would like to end up uh, this Okay. Uh, this point with a good thought about Lord Jesus Christ yes. because lies a lot on this point about food. He says in the Zara of Ages, page uh, 117, paragraph 4, he says, I read two sentences, Christ conquered by enduring the severest test. For our sake, he exercised a self-control stronger than hunger or death. And in this first victory, were involved other issues that enter into all our conflicts with the powers of darkness. Mm. It starts here. And Christ had a self-control stronger than, than hunger. I like that word victory. And we can look to Christ as the one who was victorious over, yes. over all these weaknesses, over all these temptations that the enemy knows how to place right in front of us, right? Um, I wanted to to just uh, uh, emphasize that word lust or lusting because what do we uh, understand from the scriptures that a temptation or being tempted is not a sin. Mm. Uh, To be tempted, that is the enemy's sin. Our uh, uh, falling into that would be when it touches a certain aspect of lust in us. And then we make a choice. Mm -hmm. That choice to sin, it belongs to us. Hmm. And we must be careful. Now, turning on to Monday, if you can all uh, follow on to this question number two. In what degrading apostasy did Israel take part um, at Sinai? Because not only do we have, um, you know, one, we would say, example where Israel fell. There is another example. Um, Brother Jordan. Well, it says in Exodus uh, 32 and verses 1 to 6 here, it essentially says that, you know, when they saw that Moses didn't come down from the mountain, they, they longed for leadership and they longed for, you know, some sort of guidance, but their minds reverted back to the form of leadership and worship that had happened in Egypt and, and they fell into idolatry. But not just idolatry. We don't understand today many times the things that were connected in the ancient Near Mm -hmm. East, in these cultures, Mm -hmm. Egypt, Canaan, Mm -hmm. Babylon. We don't understand today, living in the society that we do, all of the things that were connected with idolatry. Mm -hmm. And not just in Scripture. We also have evidence that outside of Scripture, there were other things involved with the worship of the foreign gods. And one of those things was immorality. Mm -hmm. Right. It was practiced as part of the worship. And so in Exodus 32 and verse six, it says um, that Aaron, you know, he saw their request. He uh, built an altar before this uh, golden calf that he had um, he had 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 made for them. And he told had told them that these are your gods which brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then I said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. But it says that they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. This is not to the invisible God. This is to the Mm -hmm. golden calf there. And it says that the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Yes. Now, the King James is a little bit ambiguous (laughs) because play sounds like something innocent. Or too kind. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it's too kind. 
However, if you look into the, the um, if you do a little word study there, there's one Bible translation that says that the people sat down to eat and drink, and it says they indulged in pagan revelry or immorality. Yes. So they, they, this was not children playing, you know, simple schoolyard games. These people sat down to eat, drink, and they let go of all moral restraints, and they were indulged in what was normal for pagan worship in those times, which hmm. was terrible immorality, violations of the seventh <clears throat> commandment. Now, this was not this. This happened not long after them leaving Egypt. This was not in a far away, we would say, desert place. They were, they were actually where and uh, where Mount, were they encamped? Mount Sinai, there, receiving the Ten Commandments. At the foot of the mountain, mm -hmm. and what was on the, the presence on of the, God? The was, presence of God yeah. was hidden uh, from them, but it was right there. And uh, with all the respect, but these people seem to have a, a problem with the memory. Hmm. Because they said, uh, 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 this yes. be thy gods, O Israel, which brought mm -hmm. thee out uh, of the land of Egypt. They were thinking, mm -hmm. uh, in Psalm, it says that they changed the glory, their glory, which was God. Mm -hmm. God was their glory, into the similitude of an ox or a golden calf. And it says, and the note, the last sentence, it says, how could greater ingratitude be, uh, have been shown or more daring insult? Uh, offered to him who had revealed himself to them as a tender father and an all-powerful king. Just remember the moment at the Red Sea. They were all cry scared. Moses, what do we do? And the Heavenly Father opened the sea for them. Yes. And how can they say that golden calf saying, uh, this is the God that got out, us out of Egypt? Mm. What an insult. Thank you, Brother Timmy, for mentioning that to us because idolatry boils down to ingratitude yeah. and insult to God. Yeah. Um, but we can repeat or we can, uh, we would say, retell the story of Egypt, of, of Israel uh, just coming out of Egypt. But idolatry is practiced where? Today. Today, right? yeah. And even, we would say, nearby our own hearts. In the camp, be, so to speak. In the camp, yes. Mm -hmm. But in which manner? How can we be also practicing idolatry or as it were, a sin just as Israel did? Brother Jordan. Well, it's really um, a several things. We can have idolatry by trying to represent the deity, um, you know, with oh, okay. by representing the God who's invisible and who says, you know, you shall not make any any likeness or any graven image. This is one way. Uh, we can also have a problem if our highest affections are on anything other than God. Mm -hmm. Even if we do not consider it an idol, a pagan God, if our affections are on it, you know, and it's it is something, it could be anything. It could be something intangible. When I mean intangible, when I say tangible, we think of things like our money, our earthly possessions, but intangible could be, I can make an idol about my reputation okay. or my or my position in my job, in my workplace, mm -hmm. or my position in the church. I can make an, I put that above my love and worship and service to God. I put this in its place. And so that's why in the note, it says that man is forbidden to give to any other object the first place in his affections or his service. Whatever we cherish that tends to lessen our love for God or to interfere with the service due him, of that do we make a God. Mm -hmm. So you see how it covers things that you cannot even visibly mm -hmm. see. It goes right to the heart. You may say, oh, you know, I don't appear to be a person that is greedy, that has a lot of earthly possessions, that wastes my earthly resources, that seems to have a, an idolatry that's easy to spot. But I can have an idolatry because I can have things that lessen my love for God or interfere with the service that is due to Him. Uh, affections, right? Affections and mm -hmm. service. Mm -hmm. Anything that takes the first place mm -hmm. uh, becomes that idol. Um, today we have, I would say, the the um, the custom is to call 
famous people, stars, right, mm-hmm. or or idols of some sort. Mm-hmm. They they're they're followed, and the more followers they have, those are you know more recognized. But let's be careful. Affections, anything that draws my heart over, if I follow or if I um, mm-hmm. you know listen to those words, they become that are uh, encouraged by these persons. Those are my idols. Those mm-hmm. are idols, as it were. Um, but closer to home, closer to the Christian, is also something that is mentioned in this in this third paragraph. Would you read that for us, brother? Sure. Every time you refuse to listen to the message of mercy, you strengthen yourself in unbelief. Mm. Every time you fail to open the door of your heart to Christ, You become more and more unwilling to listen to the voice of him that speaketh. Mm. You diminish your chance of responding to the last appeal of mercy. Let it not be written of you as of ancient Israel. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Mm. Let not Christ weep over you as he wept over Jerusalem, saying, How often... Would I have gathered thy children together as a hand doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not? Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Christ Object Lessons 237. Um, Fearful thought to refuse, to refuse, to refuse to listen to the word of God. And then uh, one day, God says, because um, it's quoted that verse from Hosea, Yes. right? Ephraim has joined to the idols. In Hosea, the Lord says that he, he wrestled a lot for Ephraim to reclaim him. That's he right. says, my heart is kindled within me. Ephraim, how can I give thee up? Hmm. So God offers a big fight for all of us. Yes. But it says, uh, uh, if we close all the avenues, then God says, He's joined to the idols. Let him alone. Uh, those are sad. And Jesus yeah. wept, right? He yeah. wept and he cries for the soul um, that is refusing or, or rejecting those words. How do we receive those words? By the study of God's word. Let us make sure that we're not those that, can, that just reject his word or, or neglect his word, the study of his word, but willingly receive it and uh, practice or, or give your heart to the, to the service of God. Yeah, because you said, um, brother, a key word these days, follow. Follow. You know, on social media, that's, yeah. that's the key word, <laughs> follow. So whom do you follow? Hmm. Follow the Lord or um, who knows how many names that don't follow the Lord? Yes. Um, you notice that we are as go- going on this journey, right? So Israel... Coming out of Egypt, the, um, the calf is worshipped, they fall a lusting, but there is another grave danger. There's another grave uh, weakness in mankind and a great uh, advantage of the enemy when he places that temptation before us. It's called what? Immorality. Yeah. Going on to that section under Tuesday. Uh, let's remember the story of, of the people of Israel and uh, Balaam. Would you help mm-hmm. us with that, Brother Timmy? Yes, Balaam was invited by King uh, Balak right, mm-hmm. to curse the people of Israel. Of course, he could not do that. Uh, he obeyed the Lord, but in his mind was devised a, a, a terrible plan against the people of Israel. He admired the people of Israel. He looked at the people of Israel, they had their tents organized around the tabernacle beautiful. He says, it's like the garden of the Lord. Yes. Uh, but uh, he says he came with a suggestion mm. in favor of the Midianites to weaken the people of Israel and secretly arrange to uh, invite the Israelites 
on a forbidden ground. He says that they ventured there, they were beguiled with music and dancing, and they, they joined themselves, the Israelites, the people of God, joined themselves unto Baal Peor, and then they bowed down before the, the gods of, of, of the Midianites. It says that committed whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Yes. And uh, uh, the anger of the Lord was, was kindled against Israel. And um, um, probably one of the, the greatest uh, losses they, they ever had, mm. not even in a battle, it says about 24,000 people died yes. uh, after that plague, when, when the anger of the Lord was, was against them. They were beguiled with music and dancing. That's a, uh. that's a very um, uh, important aspect, especially for the younger generation. Keep in mind what kind of music uh, you choose, no? Mm -hmm. We listen. Uh, because we know Satan is, is the, the master of the music. He was the, the master musician in heaven. And as well, he relates music with dancing mm. to delude the, 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 the sacred thoughts and to divert the mind from God. Um, so as we remember from the story, Balaam could not curse the mm -hmm. people of Israel as long as they were under this protection, right? But how do you break down barriers? How do you take away that protection, you place nearby things that you can see, things that you can hear. And mm -hmm. that is exactly what was the plan mm -hmm. Balaam presented to Balaam. Balaam came with free tickets for everybody. Yes. Please come. <laughs> and uh, many of them went. Um, but included here were also not just, uh, not we would say we can mentioned in the, we have mentioned before, that the mixed multitude was there. But here the temptation came even to the princes, right? Mm -hmm. they, they were tempted to come over to the side of this uh, uh, other camp that came nearby. So we have, we have there a very, um, very important lesson for us. Now, how does this apply? And the question B, um, Satan is using the same temptations because he's hmm. practiced them for how long? 6,000 years, Six, around that. 6,000 years, and he knows very well. It's a science. You know, the Bible speaks of the science of salvation, right? The plan of salvation. We need to become uh, intelligent. We need to become wise in the plan of salvation, but the enemy he has a plan or he has also a science, made a science of temptation, of sin. And we in must the, be warned by that. Says there in the notes, Satan <clears throat> well knows the material with which he has to deal in the human heart. Mm -hmm. He knows he had studied for a thousand years. And um, uh, of course, he will not attack in the strongest points, but he will look for the weakest points. Yes. And um, if I may continue, brother, it says that as we approach the mm. close of the time, as the people of God stand upon the borders of the heavenly Canaan, Satan will, as of old, redouble his efforts to prevent them from entering the godly land. He lays his snares for every soul. Right now, uh, as, as we are preparing for the heavenly Canaan, he redoubles his effort, mm. efforts. They were at the border there. They were just about to cross Jordan and enjoy the beautiful promised land. Yes, and, they could uh, see it. 24,000, they, 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 they missed that land. Mm. And um, I think those 24,000, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, were from the new generation, correct? Right. That they had, they could have access. No, mm -hmm. um, we are approaching Cain, the heavenly yeah. Canaan, aren't yeah. we? We're also on. Um, we also have been traveling on this journey, going through the wilderness of this world, and the enemy has had success over success in bringing the same, you know, temptations. Of course, in different guises, right? In a different guise, he uses another instrument. He uses another. Um, we will say another generational speech, right? He's, mm -hmm. he's, he uses the speech of the, of the present day, but it's still the same temptation. Um, under Wednesday, I, I like to, to, I would say, um, see or 
uh, follow as, as the brethren have put these lessons together, that there are big temptations, right? There are big mm-hmm. things that we need to watch for. And there are smaller things we need to watch for. Actually, the enemy does not bring the greater temptation first. As we have been reading, he brings that music or he brings that, you know, that uh, idol nearby. Just to those words to, um, to hear from another. But what is uh, also a bad habit? Mm-hmm. What was also a bad habit that actually... Uh, always came before the um, falling, almost in every one of the cases. And uh, we'll, we'll consider that in our uh, lesson on Wednesday. What sin was frequent in Israel's journey, and how was it punished, Brother Jordan? Well, we see that um, as we're moving through Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, mm-hmm. we see that here in this section we've covered in the previous sections, verses 7 and 8, we now come to verses 9 and 10. And it says, Neither, neither let us tempt Christ, as some yeah, of them yeah. also tempted and were destroyed of serpents, neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Mm-hmm. Now, it's very interesting that when you look at the nature of their temptation, so murmuring, obviously complaining, hmm. but the nature of their tempting Christ, hmm. because also in the, in the wilderness, in the experience of Jesus, when he was tempted by Satan during that period, when he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, and he went over those three main temptations, Jesus referenced this. He says, Satan presented him with a certain situation. And we won't dwell on that because the lesson is in the original um, temptation here Mm -hmm. but but the circums the principle was the same and so when you look at what it and he quoted this experience he said you shall not tempt the lord your god and jesus was actually um uh, quoting here from exodus and it says that this was the nature of their temptation exodus 17 and verse 7 it says that he called the name of the place massa and mariba two words that in hebrew relate to complaining and chiding Mm -hmm. and murmuring because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, and then it tells us what they did. They tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Mm. Now I had to think about this. I'll be honest with you. I had to think about this for a long time to apply the principle. How do I apply this to my life? What does it mean to tempt the Lord? And why does it say they tempted the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? And it finally clicked with me after thinking about it for a considerable length of time. Let's rewind in their experience. They had ample evidence that the Lord was with them. First of all, the 10 plagues upon Egypt, Mm -hmm. then the deliverance at the Red Sea and the destruction of Pharaoh and all of his army. Then the pillar of cloud and the, and by, by, um, by day and the pillar of fire by night, take with that all of the goods and the riches that they were sent out of Egypt with. That's going back a little bit in the story. They were provided manna, bread from heaven. The Bible tells us that there was not one person whose shoes wore out, whose clothes became, you know, destroyed or worn out as well. There was not one person who was bitten by a snake or a wild animal under all the other circumstances, except when God removed his protection the one time. But the rest of that time in the wilderness, not one person. The point that I'm getting at here is that there were so many evidences throughout their spiritual journey that the Lord was with them, that he was guiding them, and that they could, here's the key, that they could trust him. Mm -hmm. And what they chose to do was when the instant they had the smallest trial, they chose, because you cannot forget the, I'm, You know, we cannot give them the benefit of the doubt. Something so miraculous that it actually disappears from your mind. They chose to forget these miraculous things, the evidence that the Lord was with them. And so the way, and so that was why it was such an offense to God that they, in the smallest trial, they said, oh, is really God leading us? Or, and they started, who did they accuse of leading them for selfish purposes? Hmm. Moses, yes. you took yes. us out here to kill us and to spoil us. So mm-hmm. how do we apply this today? The, the way after I thought about this for a while is that in our own experience and in the experience of others that we know, 
when we look back on our life, we see wonderful evidences that God has blessed us. Sometimes we have testimonies that God has spared our lives from death and we know about it. Other times we may not be aware, but uh, so many experiences. And so when we come to a trial and we are led to doubt if God is really with us in that trial, we're doing what they did as well. And we're forgetting all of the things that God has done for us in the past. And even if we don't say it out loud, by murmuring and complaining, instead of trusting that he will get us through the difficulty, we are saying with words or in our minds, is God really with us or not? Mm -hmm. We're almost mocking and, and we're almost mocking all of the wonderful evidences from before by asking, by acting as if, we have no evidence. We talked about the golden calf. They said, we don't know if this Moses is coming down or not. So we don't know if God's still among us is essentially what they were saying. Make us gods, Aaron, right? Let's find our own solution. And so look, that's why it says in the note, they had received great light. Yes. That's why it says there, as they had been un, as they had been witnesses to the majesty, the power, and the mercy of God, and their unbelief and discontent incurred the greater guilt. Further down, it says their murmuring was now rebellion, mm -hmm. and that's what it is. When God has given you and me, or each one of us, so many evidences of His love and protection and guidance in our lives, if we then complain and lose trust in Him, it it is turning it turns into rebellion. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned um, the the light, and um, in the time of ignorance, the Lord can wink, wink, overlook, right? He can yeah. overlook mm -hmm. our weakness or our complaint. Mm -hmm. um, but when we have had that ex those experiences with the Lord, when He has shown us where He brought us from, where He is, you know, uh, He saved us from what He has saved us from we then can say that we, we're not anymore in that time of ignorance. Mm. Uh, and the Lord knows uh, where our heart uh, has been convicted. So if we complain or murmur, which is more than just a one-time complaint, right? The murmuring is a repetition. Uh, if we complain or murmur at that time with knowledge, with understanding, now it's rebellious, mm -hmm. right? Now we're actually not is not a child who is hungry, who is asking for for um, food. Now mm -hmm. it is one that is yeah. right, demonstrating or showing character mm -hmm. uh, of rebellion. We must be so careful. I think that's what you mentioned, brother. That's a lesson for us today, yeah. uh, because we have seen the evidences of God, uh, God's love for us. Now we mentioned in um, in 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 the beginning that we're on this journey we're almost following as it were the steps of the people of israel in what sense then can we compare um, the experience of israel with their murmur with their unbelief with us today hmm. it says that they heard the voice of god hmm. uh, and they did provoke um, they had committed sin and they died in the wilderness. Uh, why? Because they did not believe. Hmm. With all those evidences that Brother Jordan mentioned, it's amazing. Uh, I mean, it's very sad to see that they did not believe. And um, why? It says, um, the word was preached to them. They had that amazing moment when they could realize how long God protected them from um, various animals, like those poisonous uh, yes. snakes. And they could see the gospel preached there. Christ, in that beautiful discussion with Nicodemus, he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted. And uh, when I will be lifted, will draw all men unto me. Yes. That uh, uh, serpent of brass that was lifted there represented Christ. The word was preached to them. But he says, um, Hebrews 4, verse 2, he says, mm -hmm. the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, faith. in them that heard it. So um, there has to come a dose of faith. Uh, and we need to believe God 
uh, we may have a lot of evidences, mm -hmm. but there are some things we cannot see until the end. Mm -hmm. And we need to trust God, to believe God. Yes, they did not see the end of, uh, of the journey across the Red, sea, uh, the Red Sea, but they had to believe God. Yes. They did not see where Canaan is and how it will look like. Will they have food there and something? They had to believe God. Yes. They did not see who will protect them from the Philistine, from the Philistine, the Amalekites, the Midianites, the Moabites, and whoever will come around. And they had to believe that God will protect them. Hmm. And food and clothes and everything. And you know, um, sometimes it's uh, when... I, I would just slightly touch back the point of complaining. Um, it's a matter of taste. Okay. No? When we don't like something and someone else provides for us, let's better be thankful. <laughs> mm. How thankful they could be towards God. Now, it's um, uh, coming back to, the, to this main point. It says mm -hmm. 40 years yes. in, in unbelief, murmuring and rebellion. This is a big lesson for us because it says the next sentence read in the for note. Us. Yes. Um, I will read it completely. Forty years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. It's like a mirror, copying the same things. Yes, we may use different words, but uh, the attitude could be very similar. Yes. And we need to ask God to give us faith. Christ says, when the Son of Man will come back, will he find uh, faith, faith on, the earth. on the earth? Let's ask God that uh, um, when the word is preached to us, to be mixed with faith, to believe God. We may not see the end, everything clear, the whole picture. There may be a lot of questions that we may have, but we can trust God. <clears throat> Thank you, we brother. Um, and the... Question C mentions the root of murmuring, and you touched upon it as unbelief. Um, unbelief is not not knowing or being ignorant, right? Unbelief is rejecting what you know to be true. Mm -hmm. It's not believe, not wanting to believe, which mm -hmm. is what uh, which is what is rebellion. So that can also be, well, it's a lesson for us here. That can also be the reason the Lord has not returned. In among God's people, is there unbelief, unconsecration, worldliness? These things can still be, as in ancient Israel, the reasons why mm -hmm. the Lord is not returned. And just the one uh, expression there says, be not high-minded. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that brings us to be like Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Philippians chapter 2, no? Lord Jesus Christ, Lord himself, uh, came the likeness of a servant, correct? He was not high-minded. And he was the king of the universe. He is the king of the universe. It says we, sh we should uh, um, uh, realize fearing, be not high-minded, but fear, because we stand by faith. By faith. Um, and that faith is what's going to hold us, what's going to keep us. Um, where is that faith leading? Where the Lord says he would, he's taking his people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there is going to be an end to the trials, mm -hmm. to, the, to the journey through the wilderness, the, the heat and all of that, right? Uh, there is going to be an end. And even though not all will make, but yeah. it is the promise that's, that there will be a victorious people. Let's turn to Thursday because we want to reach the end, right? Amen. Where is this journey end? In, in Revelation 15, uh, it mentions Revelation 15 verse 2, that is question B. But um, where is the journey end? We're looking to that place that is, uh, that is uh, mentioned there. But let's go to question A. Describe the key to victory despite the challenges that we face. It says How that, can we um, be victorious, brother? Keeping the commandments of God, what yes. God tells us to do, simple instructions, clear, uh, there is no debate over those, very clear, very, mm -hmm. very specific, and having the testimony of Lord Jesus Christ, uh, which is the spirit of prophecy, and uh, the spirit of prophecy Plus, the, the, um, if I can say the testimony of Lord Jesus Christ, the life that he lived. That's right. 
that's a fulfillment of all the prophecies uh, and ev every instruction that we receive from the prophecies. And ultimately, uh, there is nothing in us that can uh, obtain that victory, uh, but comes from God. He says, thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. Uh, the moment we uh, are willing to, to keep the commandments of God, to have that testimony, the dragon is wrought against us. Satan mm -hmm. is, is, is mm -hmm. ready. The moment we pledge to God, we make a covenant. Uh, sometimes I mention this uh, when there is a, a beautiful occasion, a baptism. Mm. I, I say, brother or sister, you sign a declaration of war mm, against okay. Satan. Satan is, is, is yes, ready against yes. us when we pledge to God to keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus. But victory is assured to Christ. It says Christ, uh, if I can read in the note, yes. first part, Christ imparts his righteousness mm -hmm. to those who consent to let him take away their sins. And we are indebted to Christ for the grace which makes us complete in him is to Christ. Amen. I will read the first sentence of the, of the second uh, uh, quote there. And Brother Jordan will help us with the last question. Notwithstanding the defects, notice, notwithstanding the defects of the people of God, Christ does not turn away from the objects of his care. Hmm. Uh, so he, it's not that he cannot see our defects but he is still willing to work with us. As brother mentioned, he is still covering us, wants to give us his righteousness. And we have an opportunity as well to be victorious through Christ, who is our righteousness. Um, what is the main quality or identifying quality of God's people, brother Jordan? Yeah, well, here we see in Revelation 14, 12, the, the what, should have been the experience of Israel mm -hmm. and what should be the experience of God's people now as we go to the heavenly Canaan. And it says that here are the, sorry, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And that word patience is the word endurance. It signifies endurance. So it's not just patience where we think of, you know, just I'm patient for a little bit mm -hmm. and then that, but it's endurance, right? That's why we're told that we need to have patience in well-doing in the Bible. We need to have endurance in well-doing. They did not have endurance. Why? Because as we've just discussed in the previous question, they did not continue to mm -hmm. rely on the grace of Christ to sustain them. We need to have the endurance of the saints and we keep the commandments of God. We have the faith of Jesus and this blend of the commandments of God, the faith of Jesus, it's Christ in us. It's, you know, Christ, our Savior. It's the faith of Jesus transferred to us. It is His righteousness that fills us. And our little faith is met by His, the little faith we exercise. That, the, you remember the story in the Gospels. Lord, I believe. Help mine unbelief. The yes. little faith. And mm -hmm. then the Lord reaches down and says, you know, nobody has a perfect unwavering trust in God. Otherwise, we would be in heaven. We would be like Elijah or Enoch. We would be translated by now. If we were perfectly trusting God, we would be perfectly victorious. But he reaches down. And so this all blends together. Endurance, the commandments of God, the faith of Jesus, and they have the victory because in Revelation 15 yes. verse 2, yes. he saw a sea of glass, John saw there as, a, as it was mingled with fire. And then that had gotten the victory. And then it was in yeah. what manner and, and how over what did they need to gain the victory? It was over the beast, his image, his mark, the number of mm -hmm. his name, everything that represents the kingdom of Satan, his deceptions, mm -hmm. his, his power. And so we know that um, Satan tried to divide and conquer the children of Israel. He's going to do the same as we approach the end. And there was a test over worship for them. Mm -hmm. There was the idolatrous gods of Canaan. And if you remember mm -hmm. in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, he says, choose you this day whom you'll serve. Yes. If you're going to serve the gods which your fathers served on the other sides, you know, the gods of Canaan, mm -hmm. you know, what, choose who you're going to. There was a question and there was an appeal to make a decision over worship. And in these last days, especially in the book of Revelation, we are asked to choose who you will serve. Will you choose, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of Scripture, 
or will you choose to worship the gods of this world? And in the end time, it's uh, in Revelation, a system is brought to view that will bring together all false religions under one system that is described as the beast and his image. Mm -hmm. And so that's why in the note it says, in the issue of the conflict, all Christendom will be divided into how many classes? Two Just classes. two. All false religions will be brought into one class and there will be the true worshipers of God and the other. It says those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, that's the one class, and the other class is those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. Although a church and state will unite their power to compel all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark of the beast, yet the people of God will, will not, not receive, receive it. it. And uh, to every Bible student, every child of God, this promise is still valid. Uh, the children of God will not receive it, will not receive that mark, will not give in will not fall in that in those temptations that very temptations the enemy has brought because with christ we can do all things i encourage each one of us and those brothers and sisters who are online to continue to study those these sabbath school lessons to be encouraged even though there are uh, so many things circumstances around us but the promise is sure you also can be victorious. With this, brothers and sisters, let us pray. Our dear, loving, gracious Heavenly Father, we kneel before, we bow our heads before Thee, and we give Thee thanks, we honor Thee. We're so thankful for all the great evidence of Your love, not just in the past, but in the present in our own lives. And we give thee thanks as well for the light that you brought to us from your word. Help us, Lord, so that we may see clearly the way that you want us to walk in and not fall by the wayside. Give us that victory that only comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. May he be our, uh, the heart's desire and the only one that we worship. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We want to thank you for joining us today as we study the gospel according to Paul Corinthians. Join us again next week as we study the lesson titled, The Communion Service. God bless you.